Yeah, so, that's great. Okay, okay thanks, thank Colin. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so as uh, as Mike just said, uh, there'll be questions that we can take during the lecture. Uh, we're going to be going for one hour and then uh, that can spill over into chat and discussion either here on Zoom or on the Zulip. If you post your questions on the Zulip, then they'll be persistent and we can keep on discussing them once this session is over, uh, which will be um, you know, probably uh, more useful to everyone. Um, I mean, usually when you've got a summer school, the idea is everyone's around for a couple of days and we can keep uh, discussing together. That's going to be a little bit trickier in a, in a virtual world, but the Zulip will help a lot. Uh, this is one reason why with my screen share, you're not seeing like a nice clean screen share. You've got like a bunch of window frame in there. And that's because I'm doing this from a, from a rather small screen at, uh, at home in Paris, because that's the only way that I can make it home before curfew is to be at home in the first place. Um, that also lets you see that I've got a massive number of slides uh, and I could talk for way over an hour, um, which, uh, you know, is, is more of a threat than a promise, I guess. Um, there are a few uh, bonus tracks at the end of the slides with stuff that we probably uh, won't get time to talk about, but which might be interesting to you. I'll be posting these slides online or to the Zulip uh, afterwards. Um, basically once everyone's pointed out all of the, the typos to, to me and I've, I've fixed them all. So we'll see how much of this we can get through now. The idea is that in the first lecture, we're going to be basically talking about discrete logs and elliptic curves, so mostly background. Then in the second lecture, we'll look at uh, actual protocols uh, using elliptic curves, the way that we use them today. So um, let me... our starting point, is uh, working with uh, black, blocks, black box groups. Okay, so a black box group, we mean a group where, uh, I mean, you can think of this as there are oracles doing the group operations for you, or just that there is like some literal black box sitting on your table. Your group elements are tickets, you poke them in to the inputs in the, in the black box and it feeds out the group, uh, the results of the group operation applied to them, for example. So you've got uh, operations in your black box that will do uh, addition, uh, so we're, we're working with a, with a commutative group, writing the group law using this uh, plus in a circle. Uh, and we've also got to uh, like negation and identities and uh, equality testing and stuff like that uh, inside our black box. So all of those are kind of unit cost operations. And the idea is that this abstracts away um, all of the implementation of the group. So all we know about the group is, uh, is basically that we can operate on elements and the elements just look like random binary strings that are given to us. So we can't use anything about like uh, if the elements are represented as polynomials or field elements or anything like that, that's, that's no use to us. The most important operation in the group counterintuitively for a cryptographer, it's not the group operation. Uh, it's not this, uh, this sum of elements, it's a uh, scalar multiplication. And the idea here is you've got some integer and you've got some element P of the group I'll probably be saying point all the time for group elements because they're going to end up being elliptic curve points. And that's why my group elements look like things like capital P. Uh, so you're computing M times a point. That's a uh, mathematically, we're talking about M copies of P all summed together. So we'll write a square brackets M P for this. Uh, the idea of the, the square brackets here is that uh, occasionally we want to talk about multiplication by M for particular values of M as an actual object in its own right. Okay, so we don't want to write down here just to 3P. We want to be able to talk about three on its own, multiplication by three, for example, or multiplication by something ridiculously large and not have a, people thinking that we're talking about the integer three or whatever it was. Okay, so this is uh, how you define it mathematically. It's the sum of M copies of P should keep in mind that in reality, the group order capital N here is going to be something on the order of two to the 256. So it's uh, way bigger than, uh, way, 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 way bigger than the number of things in the universe, for example. And so you can't have M copies of P and add them together. Uh, this uh, kind of computation will never terminate. Uh, likewise, uh, I mean, N is going to be that big, M is, most of the M's that we deal with are the same size as N. Okay, so ridiculously large 256-bit scalars here, typically. Okay, so 
when I said that you're treating your elements as being these sort of uh, binary tickets or just do uh, these uh, these labels uh, that look a bit random, uh, there are there are n elements in the group. So the, the most efficient compression you could have for your group elements is about log n bits. Every time I say log, think uh, log to the base two. Okay, so group operation is just one uh, black box operation. Uh, scalar multiplication is not a black box operation. This is something we're going to actually compute ourselves. And what's reassuring is that this is easy. We can compute any scalar multiple in about log n group operations. Okay. So here is your classic double and add scalar multiplication, which is like a square and multiply. If you're working in a multiplicative system, you can assume that you're given your scalar, the multiplier uh, as a binary expansion. Okay, so I mean, that's just the way you're going to get it in the computer anyway. Uh, and you just set up a register variable here, R, initialize it to zero, and then working from the top bit of the scalar down to the bottom, uh, what we do is we double every time around the loop. So double your, your variable R. And if that particular bit of the scalar is one, then you add in a copy of P to it. Okay, so the invariant of this loop, the thing you notice will never change is that R is always equal to, uh, well, it's a multiple of P because you're in this, uh, in this essentially cyclic group uh, generated by P. And it's equal to the floor of m over 2 to the i times p. This m over 2 to the i is basically the, the, a truncated chunk of the scalar, which is growing down from the top. So first time, like, when you hit the, this four line the first time, it's still 0. The next time around, you've got the first bit of m times p. The next time around, you've got the first two bits, first three bits, and so on. And you grow this all the way down until you get to the end. And therefore, at the end, r is m times p. So most of you will have seen this before, but the important thing is that this is just very, very easy. It's uh, linear in log n, which means it's, uh, uh, it, it's yeah. anyway, uh, I should uh, try to, to speed up uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here. Right, so inverting scalar multiplication, scalar multiplication being easy, going backwards is the discrete logarithm problem. Uh, and this is a given a base point P and given some multiple of P, X times P here, you need to compute x. You call this the discrete logarithm problem. It's discrete because we're in a discrete group. It's a logarithm because uh, traditionally you might call scalar multiplication, or at least outside of a cryptography, you call scalar multiplication exponentiation. So it's just the inverse of an exponentiation is a logarithm. And it's a fact that in any group, you can always solve the discrete log in square root time, okay, in square root of the group order, n. If n is really big, this is obviously kind of slow. It's, a, it's an exponential algorithm in log n. Log n is our unit of measure because remember we, we're compressing our points p and x times p being the inputs down to log n bits or something like this. Uh, and the result that we want is also log n. So everything's measured in terms of a log n. And so this is a, an exponential algorithm, but we'll call it a square root. So when I say it's a fact and we can always do this, I mean, uh, we have a bunch of explicit algorithms that will do this. Things like a baby step, giant step, uh, Paul um, all of these algorithms will solve your discrete log in time square root of n. Baby step, giant step is the simplest of these things. Uh, the idea here is uh, basically it's a space-time trade-off. I don't want to go into great depth about this algorithm. We'll uh, probably be seeing it again on Friday um, and I'll you know, insist on it a bit more heavily there. But the idea is just that instead of uh, searching linearly through all of the elements in the group, just uh, trying each multiple until you get the right one, you uh, take the square root of the group order, let's call that beta, and then it's as if you're arranging, uh, like rather than searching along a line of stuff, you arrange everything in a square and your base point is uh, in the corner, let's say, and you want to work out what row and what column your target is in. Well, all baby step giant step is saying is, if you just walk along its row until you hit a column, and then you walk down that column uh, until you get to the, the corner, then you'll find the position in the square. Okay, so uh, first you've got to enumerate your whole column. This is uh, your, your baby steps, if you like. And then you can step along the row 
you'll recognize when you've hit the column because you've just enumerated the whole thing and you've uh, stored everything in a hash table. And as soon as you hit that column, then you know, okay, right. Now I've, I've hit an element. I know my, my difference from an element whose discrete log I know, and then you can work out the discrete log of the result. So this is optimized when, you're, uh, when everything is in a square shape, because then uh, your worst case of working along a row and, uh, and your enumeration of the column are balanced, which is why you get a, a square root algorithm. So in cryptography, we mostly only care about uh, prime order groups or things that are nearly prime order. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the prime in the group order, the largest prime, is what's giving you all, all of your security. The largest prime order subgroup is what really, really matters. And that's because of uh, Pauling and Hellman, who will tell you that if you know um, that your group your group order is basically, uh, you know it's factorization. So here we're writing that out a bit more explicitly and say, well, not just uh, the, the factorization of the order, but we're writing out the group structure here as uh, being a product of uh, cyclic factors, each of them of prime power order. And so uh, here you, you really know the factorization of the group order. This is something that in, uh, in a lot of our situations is you can kind of take for granted, but not always in cryptography. I mean, factorization is actually hard. Uh, but suppose you know this, then you can solve your discrete log in the group in this rather complicated looking expression here, that many group operations. What's important here is that you can see the square roots of the primes are appearing right here linearly. Okay, there's a log n factor, which ultimately you can throw away because I mean, uh, we're interested in, well, I mean, that's, that's polynomial in log n here. Um, and when you, when you see an expression like this, so what you always wanna do is go varying the parameters, right? So you wanna take the extreme cases, the extreme cases being things like when, uh, when big N is prime, okay? So then uh, little n is one, uh, little e1 is one and little p1 is big N, full prime. And then you see what happens here is uh, you've just got square root N. So you gain nothing. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you're in the case of like uh, two to the N or something like this or two to the K, then this is telling you that it's going to cost you uh, uh, basically a K squared uh, operations here which is uh, basically nothing. The idea is you project onto the prime order subgroups and then project down to uh, the, yeah, so onto the prime power subgroups, then map your problem down onto the prime order subgroups, uh, solve a discrete log in a prime order subgroup, and then you basically lift this sort of piadically, you just accumulate piadic digits with a discrete log one by one. That's where these, uh, these EIs are coming from here. The log n's are the cost of the scalar multiplications that you need along the way. Okay. But you just iterate, iteratively solve discrete logs in your uh, order PI subgroups. And then uh, adding this all up together then gives you the, the total complexity here okay. with the, the sum. All right, all this is telling you is that the, the only interesting hard thing in discrete logs is all coming from uh, the biggest prime order here because that's what's going to dominate your complexity here everything else will just uh, melt away underneath it. So we're interested in groups that have either prime order because they'll have the, the, the hardest discrete logs for their size or nearly prime order. I mean, if you're two times a prime or four times a prime or eight times a prime, you're only losing a couple of bits worth of prime there, which makes almost no difference to the root P. Uh, and you might do that in the end if you want to use something like a, an Edwards elliptic curve or, or something like that. Um, basically because you'll get a, a, a runtime speed up for your crypto system at the cost of uh, basically nothing in uh, insecurity. But once you go allowing more of a cofactor and you're reducing the size of your largest prime relative to the, to the group order, then you're going to start causing yourself problems. Right, so while we've been talking about black box uh, problems, I mean, I've said you can always uh, solve these black box, black box discrete logs in square root time. Uh, in fact, you can always do that because we have explicit algorithms to do it and they apply to any group that you want. Okay, I mean, they're black box algorithms, so they're independent of your group presentation and you can apply them to, to any group that you like. But uh, if you restrict to that world and say, okay, I want 
sort of absolute uh, generic algorithms, algorithms that run completely independently of the presentation of the group. So we treat the group as a black box. Uh, then Shoup's theorem, which I'll just state here without going into a great deal of detail here. Shoup says that uh, if uh, little p is the largest prime divisor of n, and then you've got some algorithm A, which is uh, making t queries um, to your oracle L, which is uh, encoding the, the group law, so L for group law. Okay, so you get uh, T shots at the group law, so T group operations. This corresponds essentially to the time that you're going to run your algorithm for in, in some model of, uh, of complexity. Uh, so then uh, if you've got some, uh, some target discrete log and an encoding of your group is, uh, is chosen at random, so your group is uh, basically re-encoded randomly and then this is just ensuring that you can't really do much with it. So it's treating, it's basically uh, making your group uh, look black box. Then the probability that your algorithm will actually return the discrete log after T time or after T goes at the group law oracle is uh, about T squared over P or on the, the order of T squared over P here. Okay, so that's just a, a theorem and uh, you, Basically, uh, we can discuss this later on, or you can uh, go and uh, read Shoup's article here. Uh, all this is saying is that, uh, I mean, uh, like the, the way that Shoup argues this is uh, that he'll say, well, for whatever group and whatever discrete log uh, that, that we've got here, there is a sort of worst case encoding that will blow out the performance of any algorithm that you have up to, like there will exist this encoding uh, that will force your, uh, your discrete log algorithm to run in this, uh, this worst case time, which will end up being P to the one half. Because uh, when you wanna get this down to like, a, I mean, the probability that it's returning this is T squared over P. P remember is very, very big. So the longer you run your algorithm, the more steps you allow it to take, the closer you're going to get to being, well, like O of one or just basically something measurable, something appreciable. Uh, and to get to that point, to be bounded away from zero by a constant, you're going to need uh, t to be p to the one half. Right? Anything else will just be too asymptotically too small and the, the probability of success will vanish. Okay, so that gives you a lower bound when you're working in the abstract, uh, which is a really sort of interesting thing. It's saying that abstractly, uh, the, the discrete log is really hard. Okay, I mean, it's, uh, it's something that you can write down using two sort of bit strings, two group elements, uh, if everyone fixes the base, uh, the base element or the generator once and for all, then you can write down instances of your problem just using uh, log n bits. But solving the problem is then going to take uh, you know, uh, like n to the one half things to solve. P to the one half, where P is uh, the largest prime divisor of the, the, the group order. But that's going to be uh, basically the same as the group order. So in an ideal world, you go, well, this is cool. We've got an extremely hard problem that we can write down in very, very little space. And we can do stuff like scalar multiplication very easily in this group. Uh, so this is a good basis for doing a cryptography and setting up crypto systems that you might have already seen like uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman or, uh, well, signature schemes, which are a little bit cuter. But in practice, you can't compute with a black box group Okay, I mean, we don't have abstract groups. We don't have oracles where you, uh, I mean, you might have a computer program or a circuit that looks a bit like an oracle because you're just uh, feeding in stuff and getting your, your group elements back quite efficiently. But in reality, uh, everything is coming down to polynomials, finite field elements, um, actual concrete representations of things. And that kind of invalidates Shoup's theorem to some, to some extent, okay? Because uh, I mean, well, Shoup's theorem is still a theorem uh, it's more invalidating the, the model that we're using, uh, where we're saying, well, our, our, our algorithm can only use the group operation as an oracle. In reality, we can also look at things like uh, the size of group elements. Uh, we can look at the like, strings of zeros in their, in their bit representation. Uh, we can use the polynomial structures and try to solve the discrete log faster. Okay. So, we still get this, uh, this upper bound of hardness. It will never be harder than square root, but it's uh, generally going to be easier than square root in reality. Um, so we need concrete groups that are going to act like black box groups, which means we need their order to be 
prime or almost prime. We need the, uh, the elements to be stored in log n bits if we can. Uh, it might be a bit bigger, but you know, we want to get as close to log n bits as, as we possibly can. And the element operations are going to be computed. Well, I mean, abstractly, it's like, well, they've got to be a polynomial time. But of course, in practice, you want them to be uh, you know, like a very, very small polynomial. Uh, you want your group operations to be extremely fast. Okay. Um, like a, or one bit ops would, uh, would be better. And then your best known discrete log solutions uh, should be as hard as possible. So as close as you can to uh, square root n uh, g operations where g is the group. Okay, so our first attempt at a cryptographic group is to use a uh, prime order subgroups of the additive group. I mean, the additive group is the simplest thing. These are just uh, adding integers modulo q. And you'd say, well, why not? Let's go with that. When you try to measure this up against a black box group, okay, you remember the order that you want is, uh, is prime or almost prime. Well, that's pretty good because uh, your, your group, uh, I mean, if you're working over a prime order finite field, FP, then you definitely have prime order. Your element size is, is ideal because it's a uh, log P bits. You've just written down an integer uh, log P, uh, mod P. Your operations, I mean, this is uh, addition followed by a reduction mod P, but there's only like an overflow of one bit. So, I mean, this is extremely efficient. The only problem is the discrete log problem. The discrete log in the additive group, this is uh, basically uh, given the A and B, where B is X times A. Well, you need to work out what X is. Uh, you just do a division here, right? Uh, so uh, you, um, you divide B by A mod P which is the Euclidean algorithm. And that gives you X mod P, which is the right answer in this case. So the discrete log is uh, basically as weak as possible for the additive group, which is why we don't use it. This is a very uh, clear example of something where uh, you have a group which has like a way better than square root um, discrete log solution. And where that's coming from is precisely the fact that this is not black box. The Euclidean algorithm really needs to have a notion of size, you know, so you can say, okay, well, like uh, we're, we're reducing the size um, in, our, in our GCD. You know, I mean, there's a, the, the G in GCD is greatest, right? So you need to be able to have this notion of element size, which means you need to be able to, in this case, look at your integers mod P occasionally as if they're just integers and uh, use their size there. If, you, if we can't be doing that, then the Euclidean algorithm is, uh, is not going to work. So that's why you can't just use this approach in a more abstract level. Uh, you can't just adapt this to, to abstract groups. So your second attempt is the multiplicative group of the finite field. So here we'll use a prime order subgroups of the multiplicative group of FQ. So you might wonder why I'm writing GM of FQ and not FQ star or FQ times. Um, basically because this will fit better with the, uh, the elliptic curve point of view uh, shortly. So how do subgroups of uh, the multiplicative group measure up against black box groups? I mean, if you choose Q carefully, you can get a big prime order subgroup in there. I mean, the order of the, the multiplicative group is Q minus one. So you just want Q minus one to have a big prime P dividing it, but that's easy to make sure that's happening. Um, your elements might sort of blow up a bit here, basically because your elements are, are looking like, let's say integers mod Q, if Q is a prime. Uh, whereas n is going to be a divisor of q minus one, a bit smaller. So you'll have a bit of bloat in your elements, but that's not so bad. Uh, your element operations are, uh, are fine. I mean, uh, this is a field multiplication. So just multiply two big integers followed by a reduction. That's nothing too heavy, nothing you're not prepared to do. The problem is again, the discrete log. For the discrete log, we need this uh, sub-exponential notation. Uh, to, to state its hardness. Um, so we have this rather complicated looking expression, which either you already know and you're, you're really sort of au fait with, uh, or we can just look at it like this. Okay, so there are two parameters, there's alpha and C, and this is uh, expressing complexity with respect to the variable X here, which is usually kind of obvious. It's something like Q. So Alpha and C here, alpha is varying between zero and one and C is just some, uh, some non-negative constant. So you say, well, again, anytime you look at like a complicated expression like this, you start varying the parameters and take their extreme values and see what happens. And so when alpha is zero, 
this reduces to x to the c or soft o of x to the c. So ignore like little log factors or whatever. So it's telling you that your polynomial in this variable uh, x, um, sorry, I've, uh, I've messed up this slide here, uh, would be log x to the c. So your polynomial uh, in log x, which is, uh, which is nice. At the other end of the scale, with that lx one c, when you put one in in place of alpha, you're going to get x to the c, which is exponentially in log x, which is sort of bad, right? So this lets you express the whole range of complexities between polynomial, with uh, c being the degree of the polynomial, and exponential, with c being the kind of badness of the exponential, uh, just by varying alpha between uh, 0 and 1. Okay. So when you don't really care about c, we use a uh, parenthesis instead of square brackets and say uh, L of alpha. And when you look at the, the complexity of discrete logs, uh, back in the 80s and then uh, the 90s and whatever, using like uh, older index calculus algorithms, we're L one half. Okay. So the ideal is this square root complexity. This is a log log uh, paper that we're looking at here. Uh, but L one half is what we used to be able to do. So we knew this was never ideal, but it still wasn't so bad. Uh, as of uh, the 90s, in the early 90s, uh, we can do it in uh, L one third. Okay, so the, the state of the art general discrete logs uh, uh, software is using uh, the number field sieve for discrete logs, which is L one third, which is in here. In uh, 2013, there was an L one fourth algorithm for, uh, for finite fields of a reasonably small characteristic, and then uh, that was almost immediately improved to something quasi polynomial. Uh, which if it was polynomial, it'd be a straight line, but quasi-polynomial, I'm putting some fuzz in here. Right. So you have to think of this as for, for very small characteristic fields, like binary fields, the discrete log is now officially broken by far. For other finite fields, like a prime order finite fields, it's just uh, very far from the efficiency that we'd like. Okay, This isn't just like a theoretical or an asymptotic improvement. Uh, these algorithms have actually been implemented. Uh, they, they really work. And uh, the records we have for computing uh, finite field discrete logs have been repeatedly uh, improved over the years. Okay, so the large characteristic case is still in L1 third, which means it's really hard. It's basically as hard as RSA, but it's not optimal. I mean, it's, uh, it's sub-exponential. It's a long way from this uh, square root complexity that, uh, that we were looking for. But small characteristic finite fields like binary fields or uh, F3 to the whatever or F5 to the something or any fixed small uh, characteristic, these are completely broken. Okay, so enough about general discrete logs and things that don't work. It's time to talk about something that does seem to work, which is elliptic curves. So again, we're working over FQ. The Q is a power of P. Uh, we often think over the rationals or over the real numbers especially over the rationals, because if you've got something that works over the rationals, then you just mod P and it's working in a finite field, uh, unless you crash into a denominator or something, but uh, those are things that you can avoid. Okay, so Q is a power of P. Normally, P is not two, P is not three. Uh, that's partly because it will simplify all of, all of the presentation, partly because of uh, if you do it wrong, you get to uh, beta center tax. But uh, in some hardware implementations, you'll be interested in the case where Q is a power of two. And then to avoid these, uh, these beta set attacks, uh, we're looking at two to the n, where n is prime. Okay. So something to, to keep in mind. In practice, uh, Q is generally P or P squared for, for some experimental uh, stuff like uh, for Q. Okay. So Q is P. And for the rest of today, you can basically think of Q as being a prime P. Why we would uh, not just say, all right, let Q be P and be done with it. If you're moving on to pairing based cryptography, you're going to need uh, Q being P squared, P cubed, P to the six, P to the 12, uh, maybe even P to the 18 or something like this, P to the 11. All right, but the main unit of measure for complexity for everything here, because everything's going to end up being either elements of FQ, polynomials over FQ, tuples of elements of FQ. All of these elements take a log Q bits. So our unit of measure is, uh, is log Q. An elliptic curve for our purposes is basically a cubic equation. So here is the simplest form, 
which is a short virus trust model, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Uh, the parameters a and b here that I've highlighted in blue have to satisfy this rather obscure looking condition here. This just forces your curve to be non-singular. If you're wondering what happens if that equals zero, I've got some slides at the end to show you what happens. You end up getting back either the additive group or the multiplicative group, okay, which we've already spoken about. Uh, this is the kind of condition where once you're working over a big finite field FQ, this is not really a problem, okay? Because uh, once you've chosen a particular A, the, the number of B that could make this equal zero is, uh, is very limited. It's like at most two of them. And, uh, and so if you're choosing A and B at random, you're never going to land on a pair that makes this uh, be zero. But in any case, it's, it's easy to test. Just wanna basically tell you that this is not a very restrictive kind of condition. You have a natural involution on the curve, which we'll call minus, which given a solution x, y to the equation or a point on the curve, as we'll call it, x, y, it just negates the y coordinate and leaves x as it is. You can see if you do that here, so take the equation, take a solution, leave x as it is and swap the sign on the y while you're squaring y, so it's still a solution to the curve. So your solution to the equation come in pairs uh, where you're, well, pairs with the same x and with the uh, y replaced by its negative. The, the only things that don't have real pairs here is where uh, y equals zero and it is its own negative. Okay, involution meaning you apply this transformation twice in a row and you get back to where you started because minus minus y is y. The points on the curve are the solutions to this equation. Here, this, uh, this funny k here, I just mean fq. And we have a unique point at infinity, oe, okay, which we're just saying is somewhere off the page if you were graphing this thing. This is the, the zero element of the curve. For the moment, if you want, you can treat OE as being just this sort of formal device, meaning your algorithm, that's what it might be. It might just be a, a sort of special symbol. But the idea is there is one point on this curve that cannot be expressed as a solution to, the, to this affine equation in little x and little y. And that point is point at infinity. We usually deal with our curves, uh, right. So short bias, there's a question in the Zoom chat, which is, does this kind of equation exist for any characteristic? Here I'm assuming that P is not two or three. Okay, so uh, here, uh, as I was saying, normally P is not two and three, and from now on, we're, we're just going to make that assumption for, for simplicity. There are compact normal forms in characteristic two. Uh, there are also compact normal forms in characteristic three, but we, we really don't sort of care about them. Everything algebraic that I'll be saying here uh, that sort of depending on an explicit equation like this uh, has an analog in whatever characteristic you want uh, and can also be transferred to, to other kinds of curve equations like uh, Edwards equations or Montgomery equations. Later on, we'll be looking at, uh, at Montgomery curves. Uh, but here, so long as P is not two or three, we can always put things exactly in this form. And so this is kind of the nicest form to, to talk about because you're, you're not excluding any examples there. Okay, so uh, we want to look at our curves using projective coordinates. Uh, I mean, this is kind of on the one hand like a mathematical uh, comfort, but it's also uh, algorithmically important. And so rather than looking in the, the XY affine plane, we work in the, uh, in the projective plane P2. So this is a, a two-dimensional surface with three coordinates, all right? Uh, so we take our coordinate tuples, and instead of saying like a alpha, beta, gamma, uh, you know, as being like a, the three coordinates in three-dimensional space, what we do is, first of all, we throw away the origin in three-dimensional space, and then we work modulo this equivalence relation here which is we say that alpha, beta, gamma is equivalent to lambda, alpha, lambda, beta, lambda, gamma uh, for any non-zero lambda, all right? And you think, okay, well, this, this looks a bit funny, but ultimately what's happening here is uh, uh, what we're saying is that any two triples are specifying the same projective point if they're on the same line through the origin, through zero, zero, zero. So the way that you really want to think about this is uh, this is, it, it sounds like 
kind of a, like a, a wonky mathematical thing, but this is the way that you actually see things, or it would be the way you saw things if you only had one eye. So you place your eye at the origin, zero, 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 and then any two points that are on the same line, it's like the Saturn ray going into your eye, they look the same, they're identified under your vision. So the projected plane basically uh, gives us that sort of sense, um, but, uh, but mathematically and, and quite conveniently. So we have these coordinates, we're going to use a big X, big Y and big Z on the projected plane. Uh, the idea is that, uh, so here uh, I'm using alpha, beta and gamma, but what we want is big X, big Y, big Z. Uh, they can be zero or no, non-zero at a point P, uh, but they don't have any other well-defined values. Okay, so what this means is you can say that some expression equals zero, but you can't say that it equals some particular non-zero value like one. Okay, so if you take a homogeneous equation in X, Y, and Z, then this can be zero or it can be non-zero and that's well-defined, but the particular non-zero value is not well-defined. The reason for all this is if you take say capital X and apply it to a projected point here, that'll give you alpha, but you could have applied it to this representative instead lambda alpha, and now x is equal to lambda, right? So actually x is equal to all non-zero lambda as you range it over all of these representatives with the same point in the projected plane. So you, you get this sort of scaling thing that, that always uh, messes up your actual values, but you can always use a quotient of these values that have actual non-trivial values. If you take a quotient of two polynomial expressions of the same degree, so x over z has an actual value. If it's x over z of lambda alpha, lambda beta, lambda gamma, you take lambda alpha over lambda gamma and then the lambdas cancel because they're not zero and you get uh, alpha over gamma, okay, which is what you would have gotten if you'd taken any other representative. Okay, so we have functions that have actual values. Uh, we, now we're, we're getting to this, uh, can you imagine this as an upper sphere? Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what we mean by, by upper sphere except like a kind of like a hemisphere or, or something. And it's not quite, if that's what you're thinking, like uh, like if you're looking up into space uh, from the origin, it's not quite this because you then have to kind of identify opposing points of the horizon at ground level. So it's kind of a bit twisted up uh, in that sense. But this, it might make more sense to talk about what it is rather than what it isn't. Uh, your, your XY plane, A2, fits in side almost all of P2. So most of your points are actual little x and little y if you map them to little x, little y, one here. So just fill in that last coordinate with one and then the inverse just normalizes by dividing through by the z coordinate. This is only defined when your z is not zero. And then the, the missing part where z is zero is uh, the line at infinity. Okay, so there's something new here, uh, something that's in projective space, but not in the affine space, which is this line where Z is equal to zero, okay? Because uh, you, if you take Z equals zero, then so long as X and Y are not both zero, you have a legal point, but it has no image under this map back to the, the, the familiar affine plane because you'd be dividing by zero. But when you think, well, I'm dividing by zero, you know, your naive answer to this is, well, you get infinity when you divide by zero. So when z equals zero, intuitively, your point is, uh, is sort of infinitely far out, let's say. Okay, so that missing part, that's why we call it the line at infinity. When z equals zero, this is giving you a linear condition. So geometric, geometrically, it's a line and it's kind of infinitely far away. All right, so when we take this substitution of little x and little y and taking big X over big Z, big Y over big Z, then we get a projective version for the, uh, for the elliptic curve. So we basically just expand out the, the elliptic curve equation and then clear denominators. We'll end up with uh, y squared z is x cubed plus ax z squared plus bz cubed. And this is now giving us a curve in the projective plane. The affine points, so the, the traditional points, alpha, beta, they just become projective points, alpha, beta, one, uh, or if uh, alpha and beta had some denominators, you could uh, scale them, scale up your point and push them over onto the z-coordinate. And that's very useful for us. 
But the point at infinity now becomes not just a formal device, it becomes an actual thing. If you put z equals zero in here and say, well, what part of my curve is hiding on the line at infinity? You find that when z equals zero, this equation, well, all of these terms with a z disappear and you get x cubed equals zero, which means x has to be zero. So x is zero and z equals zero, y is not allowed to be zero for projective points because you can't have all three zero. And then you can just normalize whatever that is by dividing by an appropriate lambda, you can scale back down to zero, one, zero when you get a unique solution. So there's one point out there. This is not the only projective model of the elliptic curve. Uh, this is not the only model we use to compute with, uh, but this is uh, the, the one that will be most useful to us right now. Okay, so here I have this sort of technical point, which is uh, here I'm saying, well, for any sort of algebra K over FQ, basically some number system over FQ, like a ring where, uh, where FQ makes sense. Uh, so this could be a field extension, or you could be adding formal symbols, or uh, I don't know what, uh, whatever you want to do. Then you're going to get a set of points out of this. So your elliptic curve is basically this uh, this uh, machine or a mathematical machine, which is you feed in things like fields containing FQ, or number systems containing FQ, uh, uh, algebras containing FQ, and it will give you back sets of points of solutions to uh, the defining equation of the curve and this uh, famous point at infinity the whole time as well. You can write that down in projective coordinates as well. Okay, and we still have this unique point at infinity. You're not going to get any others by, by taking a bigger field. The reason I want to sort of highlight this and we'll be using this notation for the rest of the time is because we really want to think of elliptic curves as uh, machines that produce groups. You plug in a field, you get a group back. Okay, right now we've got a set, but we're going to define the group law. So the group law uh, is uh, based on this, this projective notion that, first of all, all lines intersect with your elliptic curve in exactly three points, if you count multiplicity. Like if you're tangent somewhere, you're going to count that point twice in your, in your count of three. Okay, why three points? Because it's a cubic equation. So if you just uh, plug in a linear constraint and uh, eliminate, uh, you're going to get a cubic polynomial. So there's exactly three points up to multiplicity. This is a Bezu's theorem. And the thing is that if two of them are in the set, then so is the third. Okay, if, uh, if you have two solutions to a cubic equation, you must have the third one. Like to a cubic polynomial, you have to have the third one there. Okay, just by dividing out by, uh, by the part you already know. So the group law is telling us that if we have three points P, Q, and R on the curve, which is like having three different solutions to the equation if you want, uh, but if you have three points that are on a line together, then they will sum to zero. That's basically the rule that gives you the whole group law. The identity element under this, uh, under this uh, group law um, is uh, the point at infinity, which is why we're, we're so interested in, in it. It's not just like uh, the one point it's inconvenient because it doesn't have a normal representation. It's also uh, the one point that's really essential to any group. It's the identity element. Now, every vertical line, if you take a little x equals alpha, it's going to intersect your cubic uh, curve in three points, uh, alpha beta one, alpha minus beta one, and the point at infinity. This is in projective coordinates. This is just for some beta being, well, the square root of uh, alpha cubed plus a alpha plus b. So there will be some beta and you get these three points here. Uh, and so the point here is that when beta is one of the square roots, well, minus beta is the other one here. So if you start with some point, take the vertical line through it, it will go through the point at infinity. And then the third point of intersection will be the point you started with, but with its uh, y coordinate negated, which was our involution, the minus sign. So this is uh, this involution is actually a negation in our group with respect to this group law. Uh, if we look at it graphically, and uh, I had a bunch of uh, nicer diagrams here that I was uh, going to use, but uh, I discovered not so long ago that uh, after a system upgrade, my uh, my tech live is messed up, and so all of my points end up being. Uh, on exactly the same point. So you've got these kind of ugly diagrams uh, that I've just cut and pasted in. 
uh, if you want to sum two points together, P and Q, and get their sum R, you take the line through P and Q, you take the third point of intersection, because you know that this P and this Q and this thing which we'll call minus R are going to have to add up to zero. Okay, so that means minus R is the negative of what you want. And so then to get what you actually want, the sum R, you just negate minus R. So you flip it over the x-axis, you negate its y-coordinate. So here, what we're looking at with these curves here, if you take y squared equals uh, x cubed plus ax plus b, and, uh, and you imagine you're working over the, the real numbers and you graph uh, the solutions to this equation, you'll get something that looks like this. Uh, you could also get basically these, uh, these two, well, the sort of the waist of this curve gradually uh, joining together and a bubble splitting off to one side. When we talk about uh, your curve being uh, non-singular, that means avoiding having an intersection here between uh, these two bits here, for example, yeah. or like a, a sharp corner in, in your curve. All right, so that's how you compute the group law, geometrically at least, that's how we, we see it. When you then slide P and Q together, so make them approach each other on this curve until they eventually coincide, well, you can imagine you're, you're just dragging the line through P and Q along with it, and it's going to basically deform to the tangent at P. So when you want to double the point, you don't uh, take P and then the line through P in itself. Well, the line through P in itself, you take the tangent at P instead. And then the same geometric group law applies. But uh, we don't want to sit here drawing graphs. We want a circuit to actually do this at the end of the day, or you know, like a software. The important thing is that, uh, you know, like since uh, Grotendieck, I guess, or well, no, even, you know, back to Zabriskie and, uh, and before that, uh, algebra and geometry are the same things, even up to like Descartes would tell you that uh, algebra and geometry are the same things. Um, but uh, algebraic geometry is just basically equations, but with pictures, uh, with, uh, with better pictures. So we use that sort of backwards and uh, turn everything into just polynomial relations in the end, which we can compute with in terms of coordinates. So uh, when we want to compute the, the group law, its x coordinate is given by this, x of p plus q is this quantity, y of p plus q is this quantity, where lambda is essentially the slope of the line through p and q, which again, you don't have to get out a ruler and a compass or anything, you just uh, do some field operations and you get it. And then a uh, new is a similar sort of expression here. You have this sort of a uh, decision to make if P is Q or not, then uh, you'll you know, change the formula that, that, that you use. But ultimately this is just algebra. And then you get uh, the fact that, well, we wanna take these formulae here and uh, implement them in software, put them into a, into a computer. And this is why I brought up projective coordinates in all this. I mean, you think, why are you talking about projective coordinates? This is SAC. It's not like a like a mathematics master's course or whatever um, in in algebraic geometry. Uh, the reason why I brought up projective coordinates is because algorithmically they're what you want to use. Uh, the main reason is you want to avoid inversions like this. Okay. You want to avoid doing divisions all the time. Basically, because uh, when you divide, you're going to have to compute an inverse mod p. Uh, you're going to either be doing like a big exponentiation or you're going to be calling the Euclidean algorithm. This is going to cost you much more than one field multiplication, for example. So you want to avoid inversions where you can. And so we use projective coordinates because we can continually push denominators across onto the z-coordinate. So we need addition, we need general scalar multiplication. We need this uh, operation here because that's what we need in our protocols. And we implement them using addition chains. The most basic one being the double and add loop that I, that I showed you earlier, scalar multiplication. We'll be looking at more sensible things uh, later on. So the, the main subroutines you need are going to be addition. So we're just given two projective points, get the projective sum. Uh, you need doubling. And it's useful to have a mixed addition here. Uh, this is where one of the operands is fixed. Like uh, in our scalar multiplication, for example, you saw that you were continually adding in P. You were always doubling R, but the only time you saw a plus it was R plus P. So adding in fixed base point P. 
So uh, for that, uh, if you can simplify the form of the fixed point and maybe normalize it so the z coordinate is one, then at least you know if you're ever supposed to multiply by z, you can do nothing, right? So uh, special cases like this can be useful. There are databases online of the sorts of formulae that you need to do this. Uh, without going into the detail of the, the group law like this, I mean, uh, you don't need to memorize it. You just need to code it once. When you're coding it, you should be uh, basically taking uh, standard formulae for doing this. And you find that it turns into a straight line program like this. So this is your projective addition. Uh, if you sort of read down through here, you can count the operations that you're using. It's not completely obvious that this is computing the same thing, but this is something that like as an exercise, if you like, you can basically compare this to the algebraic form and check that it's doing the same thing. Here, I just want to con convince you that this is uh, something that, be that can be computed using a rather simple straight line program with a, with a relatively small number of field operations. Projective doubling is the same deal. You can see the, form the formulae are not the same as what you're using here. So you can't just uh, plug in the same P in, well, you can't take a X2, Y2, Z2 equal to X1, Y1, Z1 in this formula and hope to get the right answer. Okay, so for, for short via Strauss curves, these are the sorts of algorithms that you'll be using. I'm just showing you this so you see the, the level of complexity that's involved, which is ultimately not very much. But when you add this all up, you go, okay, well, doubling a point costs you five multiplications, six squares, and, uh, and one multiplication by a constant. Addition on the curve is costing you 12 multiplications and two squares, uh, you know. So uh, here it looks like you're, you're, I mean, depending on what uh, a square costs relative to an addition, et cetera, you, you, would, you would think that all of this, you're, you're basically on the, on the order of like 10, 11, 12, 13 uh, field operations. Uh, per group operation here. And what that means in the end is that given that exponentiation in the elliptic curve, like scalar multiplication here, uh, you want to compare this to what you'd be doing in a finite field where you go, well, hang on, uh, instead of one finite field multiplication, I'm now doing a dozen uh, to, to, to add on my elliptic curve. You think, okay, well, it looks like elliptic curve uh, operations are an order of magnitude slower than they would be in the finite field. And that's true for the same finite field, okay, when your elliptic curve equation is defined over the same FQ as uh, the finite field, uh, as, as your multiplicative group, uh, then you will have this uh, massive slowdown. But the advantage that we have here is that the discrete logs seem harder for elliptic curves. So we can use uh, elliptic curves of much smaller fields to get the same level of security. And so when you do your trade-off, you know, sizing your elliptic curve to, to have the same security level as your finite field would, what you find is that uh, the finite field involved is much smaller. So on, a, on one, one important angle is that uh, this makes your, your, your public keys much smaller uh, because uh, elements of the group have much smaller representations because they're represented using much smaller finite field elements. Um, but uh, also what you find is that when you do your trade-off, uh, scalar multiplication in your elliptic curve is much faster than it would be in the finite field. So to compare the, like to make this more concrete, and this is using your sort of state-of-the-art algorithms, these are the, the estimations uh, that we have for, for what appropriate security levels, uh, well, what appropriate parameters for a given security level would be. Uh, here, um, I'm including, so what's in gray here, like uh, it's not just for like, if you've got gray hair, this is, if you're like in the Natural History Museum, you find these parameters here. Here, the 80 and 96 lines, they're in red because they're sort of dangerous and you should never use them. Um, this sort of 80-bit security level is something that, uh, you know, we're not far off in practice. Um, we're still a bit of a way away from this in terms of elliptic curve discrete logs. The, the, the world record for computing elite, an elliptic curve discrete log is, uh, is I think, about 112 bits. Um, which is pretty small compared with 160 bits. But you shouldn't think of these as offering any kind of long-term or reasonable security. These are basically obsolete. What we're looking at at a minimum these days is more like uh, 128 bits. So this is a 256-bit field for elliptic cryptography, but you'd be using something uh, 12 times bigger 
for finite field based cryptography if you're working in the multiplicative group over FP. So you're 12 times bigger. And then you go, well, I'm using about 12 times as many multiplications to do my elliptic curve operation as I would be in a finite field. But multiplication is not really linear in the, in the parameter length. Um, I mean, you might think, oh, yeah, but you know, fast multiplications, it's like uh, n log n or, or something like that if you use uh, like uh, Harvey and uh, van der Hooven's new algorithm. But uh, in the sort of ranges that we're looking at here, that's not at all how it works. Um, and you, you look at the actual cost of multiplying uh, 3,000 bit integers compared with 256 bit integers, and you can, uh, you can do 12 of these short multiplications much faster than you could one of these big ones here. Okay, so elliptic curves are smaller and they're faster. Um, what's really remarkable about this is that um, the, uh, um, when you look at these parameters, basically what I'm saying here is your security level being 128 bits. That means you should be looking at something like two to the 128 operations to solve a discrete log or you know, to break your key in this case, so to solve a discrete log. And then uh, here I'm saying it suffices to take uh, an elliptic curve over FP, where P is a 256 bit prime field. So that means your elliptic curve, uh, which being a one dimensional object over FP is going to have roughly P uh, elements in it. Uh, and we can be more precise about that. Uh, it's going to uh, have about two to the 256 elements in it, roughly speaking. I mean, the Hasser interval will tell you that it's very, very, very close to that. Uh, the Hasser bound will tell you this. So that means that what we're really looking at here is square root hardness. Uh, this is something that I thought I had a, a slide explicitly stating this, but the, the simple fact is that the best algorithms we have for solving elliptic curve discrete logarithms are square root algorithms. They are the algorithms that I mentioned at the start, things like uh, Pollard Rho. I mean, Pollard Rho uh, is state of the art. And the only difference between Pollard Rho for elliptic uh, discrete logs and Pollard Rho for black box discrete logs is that uh, with the elliptic curve, you can use this uh, negation map to your advantage. But you can do equivalence classes under the involution where y goes to minus y. Uh, so doing that carefully. Uh, you you save like a, a square root of a bit or something, um, something that can be made much more precise, but you, you save a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of effort, but you're still in square root complexity here. And so this is something that's really fundamentally remarkable. Uh, and uh, I, I think a, a point where it'll be good to, to stop on this note. So that uh, elliptic, curve, elliptic curves were proposed for constructive use in cryptography uh, back in 1985. So we're looking at, you know, like uh, 35 years of uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, elliptic curve discrete logs were already uh, an interesting problem before that algorithmically, but it's not like many people were looking at them uh, in, you know, across the world. But over the last 35 years, a lot of people have been working on elliptic curve discrete logs. They've been working on discrete logs in general. And you saw on the slide before where I had these uh, various difficulties for, for finite field discrete logs, that there's been this, uh, this continual improvement from L1 half down to L1 third, uh, down to in some cases, a uh, quasi polynomial. Okay, so finite fields over the last 35 years in the multiplicative group, there's been this uh, con continuous improvement and uh, records being broken all over the place. In uh, the world of elliptic curves, there's been essentially no improvement in 35 years for discrete logs. We cannot do better than the square root algorithms that we had 35 years ago. The only real improvements we have are just practical things like uh, distributed computing, like uh, we, we manage this better. We, we have better, uh, more practical versions of our, uh, like uh, distributed versions of our algorithms than we used to, but uh, the, the work factor is the same. Okay, the, the complexity of this problem is still the same. So elliptic curves are really, really hard and they're kind of mysteriously hard. I mean, there is no reason, there's no philosophical reason why they should be this hard. When we talk about Schupp's theorem and we say, well, like abstractly, the discrete log really is a square root problem. Uh, when we say that we're talking about groups where you can't see how they work 
you can't even really see what particular elements look like. They just look like random blobs of bits and you feed them into a black box and it spits out another ticket, right? Uh, you, you have no insight into how the group law is, uh, is constructed uh, or how the group operates. You can't meaningfully compare different group elements except to say that they're the same or not. Whereas for an elliptic curve, there's nothing generic about this. You have a cubic equation, right? You've written it down. The group law is this uh, very short straight line algorithm. The group elements are uh, uh, things like X and Y, although you can compress Y down to a single bit just to get the, the sign of it because uh, otherwise it's determined by the X coordinate. So you can see basically everything about a particular point on a geometric object, which is not just some random geometric thing, it's defined by a cubic equation. But in 35 years, this has given us the square root of almost nothing uh, in terms of an improvement to the discrete log problem. So the discrete log problem classically is really, really hard. In a quantum world, of course, it uh, becomes substantially easier, uh, which is why we have uh, uh, post-quantum cryptography as a, as a field and as a, as a means of employment uh, for many people. Uh, but so long as we're sticking to classical machines, elliptic curve discrete logs are, are basically the hardest kinds of problems that you can generate for their space, well, for the space that it takes to say, state them, when you need to generate a massive number of problems that are all uh, expected to be of exactly the same difficulty. So this is, a, 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 I'd like you to think about this problem, uh, think about what it means for it to be hard. Uh, I'd like you to get this idea that there is no moral reason why it should be so hard, but on the other hand, it's ridiculously hard in practice. Uh, we don't seem to be able to make any impact on this thing. And that's uh, basically why elliptic curves are so uh, precious and useful to us. I'm going to stop there for, for, for this uh, hour's worth. Uh, I'll put these slides up. There are many more slides after this one, uh, which uh, you can sort of use as a reference or a read through at your leisure. I'll just quickly scan through those though to, to show you a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is this, the size of the group, which we expect to be Q plus one plus uh, root Q on the average. In fact, you can be very precise and say that it's Q plus one minus a thing called the trace, which is bound by, bounded by two root Q in, in absolute value. You think, well, what does that mean? What this really means is that uh, if you take Q and you write out its binary expansion and then you write out the binary expansion of, of the group order, the top half of the most significant bits match. All right, so uh, your group order is always very close to the order of the field, but there's a fair bit of variability in here. If you vary the parameters A and B, you can gradually get elliptic curves of, uh, well, over a prime field over every possible value in this interval here. Okay, so there are lots of elliptic curves with lots of orders. That gives us a bit of flexibility when we're choosing elliptic curves for cryptography. We can look at the, the group structure of the curve, which, uh, which we write out here. You find that the group structure of the elliptic curve, it's a product of two cyclic groups, okay, one of which might be trivial. Okay. So uh, here, like your D2 uh, might, be, might be one. Okay. Uh, and in practice, you're, you're usually mostly cyclic. The kinds of elliptic curves that you'll meet in practice, you're like a big prime factor times two times another factor of order two or something. But you can't go having any kind of group structure you want. You have something that's almost cyclic in some sense here. I've also got two bonus tracks in here. Uh, the first is relating discrete log and, uh, and Diffie-Hellman problem hardness. This is a problem that uh, won't necessarily occur to you until we start looking at Diffie-Hellman uh, later on. But uh, at that point, when I say, well, uh, we, we treat these as having the same hardness, this trick here will explain how that works. Okay, why we, why we act as if they have basically the same hardness in practice. And it's a really uh, cute use of elliptic curves um, uh, in cryptography. Uh, which is sort of, uh, well, it's, it's a cute application of elliptic curves in theoretical computer science. Okay, so you solve discrete logs 
in a generic group, like in a black box group, using an elliptic curve on the side, which is, uh, which is something quite cute. And then finally, uh, when I said you need your elliptic curves to be uh, uh, non-singular, so you need this, uh, this funny expression to not be zero, uh, at the end, I have an explanation of what happens if you let it be zero, like what happens to your group law. So this is some algebra that you can work out. And what you find from this is that elliptic curves end up being a kind of deformation of the ge geometric group, like uh, the, the multiplicative group. If you let your curve suddenly become singular, you imagine like varying it in space and suddenly it gets itself into section, then you can keep on doing the same group law that you would normally do. You know, this uh, draw a line through P and Q, uh, see what happens. But what happens is that when your curve picks up a singularity, this uh, this group law degenerates to become uh, like a, a sort of a lightly obfuscated version of the multiplicative group law. And you can also get the additive group in this way as well. So you can look through the algebra of that for yourself if you're into that. Uh, but the, the moral of that story is just to say that uh, um, elliptic curves are basically a, a sort of generalization of the multiplicative group in this sense. You know, they, because the multiplicative group is, is a special degenerate case of an elliptic curve. So elliptic curves really are a, a natural thing to work with in that sense. And what that means for us algorithmically is that any elliptic curve algorithm always has a finite field analog, okay? Because you can just plug in this broken elliptic curve and see what happens. Uh, and likewise, uh, any algorithm for, uh, for, for your, your multiplicative group that is multiplicative, okay? So any finite field algorithm that doesn't do additions and subtractions has to have an elliptic curve analog as well. This is not just like a trivial statement. I mean, this is something that you see for like a ECM factoring, which is a, a natural generalization of uh, P minus one factoring, for example. So this is something we use all the time. And in crypto, we use this in the sense that uh, uh, finite field uh, protocols immediately have elliptic curve generalizations. So those are the, the bonus tracks and the, the group structure derivations that you can look through if you're into that. And we'll come back in uh, 50 minutes or so, or 45, uh, and look at some actual cryptographic applications of this stuff. Uh, if you have any questions about things like anything that we've seen here, or anything that you think is a natural question based on what we've seen here, I'll be around on the Zulip to, to handle questions uh, between now and the next talk, and then ongoing uh, throughout the week as well. Okay, so thanks for your, your patience. Go and have a break or a, a breather uh, or coffee or whatever, and we'll uh, get back to some more content at six o'clock my time, which is, I don't know what time, wherever you are, but it's the next whole hour. Thanks.